Latin from scratch, the passive voice. We are going to study like almost the last thing about morphology of verbs. Now, the passive voice. Uh, until now, we were studying the active voice. First, we were like indicative, etc., then the subjunctive, but everything was in the active voice. Now, we have to start with the passive voice. And here, you can see that it's going to be uh, quite simple because before we were present indicative, present subjunctive, perfect uh, indicative, subjunctive, everything of the uh, uh, active voice, but now it's just one lesson for the passive voice. And it's going to be quite easy, you will see. And before starting with the morphology of the passive voice itself, first let's begin by studying the syntax, because there is some specific things in the passive voice which don't appear in the active voice. So first, let's study these uh, special complements. A sentence in the passive voice is pretty much a transitive active sentence in which the point of view is changed. So in English, we would say, I eat an apple, active, an apple is eaten by me, passive. Okay, so that's pretty much the same sentence, but said in, uh, from different perspectives, okay? One is active, the other one is passive. Transitive active sentences, so transitive means that it has a direct object. So transitive active sentences express the action from the point of view of the agent, so the agent is the subject. So the subject is the person or thing which does the action. Of course, this is kind of like super vague explanation, but I mean, we don't need to know exactly, okay? We just need to understand what we are talking about. So, this, the subject is the agent, whereas a passive sentence expresses the action from the point of view of the patient. So, in the passive voice, the subject is not agent, it's the patient, okay? So, that's a huge difference. Now, the main features of a passive sentence are the verb, of course, is in the passive voice, which we are studying now. Then, the subject is the patient, not the agent. Of course, the patient subject agrees with the passive verb. So, always, the subject agrees with the verb. It doesn't matter if the subject is active, agent, passive, uh, patient. Subject agrees with verb, always. The agent is expressed in the ablative case with the preposition a or ab when it is a person. Things are expressed without preposition, so ablative without preposition, and are better analyzed as cause rather than agent, because, of course, uh, to be an agent, you have to have agency. Things don't have agency, okay? So things uh, better than agents are the cause. Okay? The rest of the complements are expressed in the same way as in the passive voice. Okay, so that's it, pretty much. That's the only differences between the active and the passive. The most important one being this. The agent is in the ablative case with the preposition when it is a person. Okay? Now, let's go there, to the passive morphology. There is a very important difference between present stem tenses and perfect stem tenses. Okay, this is a very, very important difference. Tenses such as the present, imperfect, etc., have, uh, have, or not, have uh, their own endings, which we are about to learn. Whereas tenses such as the perfect, pluperfect, etc., so perfect stem tenses, are more similar to the English passive voice, which actually makes it confusing. We are going to see why it makes it confusing. So first, we have to learn the passive endings. Until now, if you remember at the beginning, in the first module, we said, okay, so we are going to learn the endings, and we call them the active endings. And we were saying, like, except for the perfect, indicative, active, which has its own endings, but uh, we were all the time using the active endings. Okay, so now, the passive endings. And now these are just like just like the active uh, endings that we were using for most tenses. Now passive endings are used instead of the active endings. Okay? 
So these endings are used only for the present stem tenses. This is important, okay? Only for the present stem tenses. Present, perfect, future, etc. So, uh, well, here they are, okay? There's no, nothing difficult here. Only, uh, you might see that some of the endings are quite similar to the active endings, which is good. Then here, notice that there are two endings. Most of the times, tres appears, but you can also find tre. That's how it is. Um, then tur, mur, mini, this ending is quite weird, okay? Because it doesn't look like anything that we might know from before. But most of the others, like, look quite similar to things that we know. This mini is like super weird. Even linguists don't know where it comes from, etc. Whatever. So the most frequent ending for the second person singular is ris, but re can be found in older texts or archaizing authors. When using these endings, a phonetic change happen, happens. I'm missing an s, okay? Happens in the second person singular in the present indicative only in the third and mixed conjugations and in the second person singular in the future indicative in the The short E followed by the R of the ending becomes E. So we have dukiris, so it becomes dukiris. Okay, so mm, that's just how it is. Now, present stem tenses. The tenses which uh, are formed on the present stem, indicative, present, imperfect, and imperfect future, subjunctive, present, and imperfect, are conjugated in the same way as the active voice, but using the passive endings. So everything that we were saying, for example, for the imperfect, we have to use the present stem, the morpheme, whatever, the uh, other morpheme, ba, and the active endings. So now for the passive is exactly the same, but instead of the active endings, the passive endings. So, here we have, for example, uh, present indicative. Okay, so you see that is exactly the same. Here you have the underlined letters have undergone the phonetic change, uh, short e, uh, short e. Okay, so dukeris capiris. It should be dukeris capiris, but uh, you see, no, e, e, e. E, 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 uh, but it is not E, it's E because of this uh, change that we just mentioned, okay? And this change also happens in the future, no? So here it should be like E, 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 so it should be ama, uh, Amabilis or Monebilis, but no, Eris, Eris instead of Iris, Iris. Uh, that's it, okay? We are not going to be reciting all of this because it's pretty much the same that we already know. And just uh, to, to make it clear, here you have the present indicative and the future indicative just to show, mostly, to show this change. But as I was saying, like this morphology applies to all of these tenses, okay? All the tenses of the present stem, okay? So for the present stem tenses, we use the passive endings. Now, let's see. The perfect stem tenses, which we said before that the morphology is more similar to the English morphology, but it is more confusing. Let's see. The tenses which are formed on the perfect stem, indicative, perfect, pluperfect, perfect future, and subjunctive, perfect, and pluperfect, have a different type of passive voice conjugation called periphrastic and more similar to the English passive conjugation. Periphrastic because before uh, we saw that, for example, um, this I didn't mention, so it's good that I'm going to mention now. Amor is I am loved. Uh, Moneor is something like I am admonished <laughs> or whatever. Or like uh, Capior, I am taken. Okay, so all of those, uh, you see that in Latin it's only one word. In English, we uh, use the auxiliary verb and the participle. I am loved. Okay? Now, in the uh, perfect stem, it is periphrastic, like in English. But now, uh, we have to be careful. 
However, there are important differences to take into account. The general conjugation is the following. The perfect par uh, participle, which we still don't know, we are going to, st uh, to study the perfect participle quite soon, but uh, for now, just like the summary is this, the supine stem and two plus uh, two, one, two endings. And then the verb sum in the corresponding tense. Now, what is the corresponding tense we are going to study now? While conjugating, we need to take into account not only the person and the number of the subject, but also the gender of the subject. We have to decline uh, the participle. <laughs> it's like, okay, uh, Spanish uh, interferences. According to the number and gender, singular, us, a, un, or plural, e, i, a. Uh, we are going to see this better in the practice, okay? Since the participle agrees with the subject and the subject is in the nominative case, the participle, uh, the participle will always be in the nominative case as well. Okay, so here, like you see, this is quite a big table, no? Okay, so now we have the, in in the indicative. And here we have perfect, pluperfect, perfect future. Now, here you see amatus, amata, amatum. So here, of course, you see singular, plural, singular, plural, etc. Now, singular, of course, it is us, a, um. Plural, it is e, i, a. Now, it will be us when the subject is, nominate, um, is masculine, a when the subject is feminine, um when the subject is uh, neuter. And then depending on whether it is singular or plural, it will be this or this. Okay? And then we have the, uh, the verb sum. Okay? But uh, you see that there is also another form between parentheses. Uh, for now, it is better to just ignore the, the form between parentheses. The form between parentheses is not classical Latin. This is like uh, later Latin, like um, late Latin, medieval Latin, etc. But classical, we just ignore the parentheses. Okay? Now, uh, and this applies to, to everything, okay? Now, you see here that it is, for example, I am singular and masculine. So I would say amatus sum. Now we have to be careful because, because uh, at first we would say amatus sum, I am, sum, am, no? So I am love. No, because I am love is amor, as we saw before. Amor is I am love. So what is amatus sum? Amatus sum is I was love. Okay, so uh, it's uh, tricky, <laughs> let's say. Now, Pluperfect. Amatus eram, we would say. I was loved. No, I uh, had been loved. Pluperfect. Okay, so you have to be very careful with that because the verb sum is not in the tense that we would expect. Okay, so you have to be very careful with that. Um, and that's it, okay? And we are not going to be doing all the tenses because it's always the same. Uh, now, in both tables, the form of sum between parentheses are not used in classical texts, uh, but can be found in other types of texts, which I already said. Of course, you have to pay special attention to the possible confusion. Amatus sum does not mean I am love, which would be amor, but I was or have been love etc. All the time, etc. Okay? So, uh, that's the passive voice. It is um, slightly tricky, especially for the perfect stem tenses. But, well, we are quite uh, experienced already in Latin, so it shouldn't be so hard. Now, we should go and practice. <laughs>